You're back on page 21. We've been talking about the um, idea of ministering to people in the context of what God's doing in their lives, what God's doing in our lives. God puts us together on purpose with the idea that I get to engage with you, you get to engage with me. In the process of growing, by that which every joint supplies, we grow into the head. We've been talking about the idea that there is a highly personal foundation to this ministry. This is not about me walking in and judging somebody. It's about me building a relationship with people, engaging with them in this give and take koinonia in a manner that we are highly engaged with each other's lives. There's that intimacy that's growing. One of the things that I find as I teach this is that we tend to think that this first part that Dwight has been talking about, the personal ministry part, is where it's really personal. This is the relational. And I I, I build the right within that relationship to then get mean with you. Right? You'll forgive me for being direct and pushy with you because we have a relationship. But I think it's different than that. I honestly think that this stuff that we're talking about today is a deeper level of intimacy. It's where the relationship that has been growing up out of our connection with each other, out of our uh, walking through trials together, allows us to go to that level of relationship where we we can really speak into each other's lives. I watch this often in intense circumstances where people have been through the fire together and they're able to now, we used to call it in our ministry, brutal koinonia. Those people who who are most valuable to me in my life, who are closest with me in my life, are not the ones that I've hung out with for a long time and we laugh at the same things and enjoy the same things. They're the people who, regardless of who they are, because of their love and concern for me, are able to walk into my life and put their finger on those things that I need to see. So we talk about this uh, part of the ministry, the pointed ministry, the, the one that actually gets to the point. There's a couple of things that need to happen. I need to do. I need to confront. I need to be able to hold the mirror up, the mirror of the word, and say, hey, guys, you see this? You see where you're at? This is where we are helping each other confront who we are, take a good hard look at ourselves. To do that, I need to be a person who is actually a learner. I'm one who is learning myself. I'm not going to help you learn about yourself if I'm not learning about myself. And, and notice that it's not just learned. Oh, I went through this before, and I got this one nailed down, so maybe I can help you nail it down. No, no, no. It's, it's bringing people along in a journey. I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm, I got a lot to learn yet. But together, let's go there. Let's explore this together. The second thing that I need to do is I need to provide a compass for people. I don't know about you, but I get myself into situations very regularly where I just get myself absolutely confused. I'm bogged down in the details. I'm seeing something in my life, and I can't seem to sort it out. And I need people around me who can help me navigate the word, go find answers to the situations that I'm involved in. This doesn't have to be somebody who is learned in the scriptures. It doesn't have to be somebody who necessarily has it all figured out or went to a seminar on that subject. It's somebody who can sort of hold the compass and we can figure this out together as we go to the scripture and seek to find the answers. To be that compass, I need to be somebody who actually believes that the scripture is the truth, that God has given us answers. I need to be a person who has that confidence that I can share with you. Certainly those are the people that I need in my life.
Well, what we're going to do uh, starting this morning is begin to make a uh, shift. We talked about that in this discipleship spiritual ministry uh, system, we're really always zeroing in on three different sorts of areas. We're working to build relationships with people. We're doing that primarily so that we can help people see what's true. And then thirdly, so we can help them do something about it. And we talked uh, last night about uh, what we can do to begin to connect relationally with people, to try to help people uh, realize how much uh, we love and care about them. I'll be honest with you, in when, when we began to teach this uh, and try to put this into some kind of organized system, we would literally say, if, if you came into the youth ministry I would sit down with you and I would talk you through the system and I would literally say to you that for your first two years of working in this ministry, we don't care if you never have a spiritual conversation with a teenager. I would say to them, if we have a leaders meeting and uh, we're sitting around and having this leaders meeting and I say, how's things going in your small group? And this guy's like, oh man, last Wednesday night I led five kids to Christ six kids committed to the mission field, and four kids to go into full-time pastoral ministry. And you're sitting there going, Wednesday night we talked about uh, sports and football and all those kinds of things. I don't want you to sit there thinking that something negative happened because this whole thing operates on the fact that you've got to learn to build relationships with people. The old phrase that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This is all a relationship. So we would say to them, that's fine. And one of the reasons that sometimes people think, what? And I say to them, but here's what you have to understand. That a kid comes to Sunday school because... Jimmy is there, and Jimmy loves him. And when he comes to Sunday school, guess what happens? I'm teaching him spiritually. He goes on wilderness trips. He, he's getting all kinds of spiritual input. But with this guy, I'm saying to him, we just want you to learn how to do this. Okay, so relax. Just learn how to connect relationally. And then we would say that you're going to, again, begin to build relationships with people. And then we want to train you how to take from that relationship and learn how to move that into helping people examine their lives and think about what's going on spiritually in their lives so that you can begin to help them uh, learn that. And we would say to them, that would take us about two years to help you learn how to do that. And then we would say, and then we were going to teach you how to help them do something. That would take you about two years. So we'd say, really, we're committed to about a six-year process. I really have no idea how long it took. But what would happen is, every time we did this, it was amazing how many people would just sort of exhale and go, I can do that. I can do that. And what you have is an environment of people who are growing. You're also going to find that you, you got varieties of people. There's some people you're trying to build a relationship with. You've got other people in your life that you're at a point where you've already built a relationship, and now you can start really trying to help them see what's true. And you've got other people in your world that you're already helping them see things, and you're helping them build strategies. But today, we're gonna, the first thing this morning we're going to try to focus in on is this whole business of uh, helping people see what's true. And we're going to get the ball rolling by sort of presenting to you a biblical defense, if you will, for this whole process of diagnosis, of helping people see, of trying to get a read on where people are at. This grew out of, um, this is something that was not part of the system that we created originally. But what happened was, I had been at this church for a long time. I go uh, into another environment at uh, Baptist Bible College where I'm working, and uh, I started to talk about this stuff, and I got this uh, reaction. Wait a minute. We're judging people. We're making conclusions. We're not supposed to do that. Their walk with God is their business, not my business. This is a God thing. You're t- all that kind of stuff. And so, so what I realized is we really have to help people understand the biblical concept of what we're talking about. So I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Let me give you the the foundation of, um, of what you're going to be hearing 
this morning with Dennis. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. This is not a new concept. I mean, not only here in the scriptures. This is a concept that's throughout the scriptures where Jesus is saying in this particular case, I want you to watch out for a certain kind of person. This person is dangerous. We could go back to Proverbs where David sits down with his son and he says, I want you to watch out for a certain kind of woman. A certain kind of girl that you need to be concerned about. And in each case, what they do is you say to yourself, okay, I want to be careful of that person. Well, how am I supposed to know when I'm in front of a false prophet? How am I supposed to know when the girl that's sitting across from me or the, or the girl in my class that is expressing an interest in me, how am I supposed to know that this is a girl that I'm supposed to go, oh, no, how am I supposed to know about this kid? Well, he tells him. He says, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. In other words, what he's saying is, watch their lives. And when you see these certain kinds of characteristics, that will reveal to you. See, the scriptures understands. I have people say to me, well, you can't look inside somebody's heart. And I say, I know that. That's why the scriptures say, I know you can't look into somebody's heart. So let me give you what a heart like that looks like. We could go to James, and James talks about you need to not have worldly wisdom, you need to have biblical wisdom. And then he says, well, how in the world am I supposed to know which one I have? And he says, okay, if these are the things that happen, you have worldly wisdom. If these are the things that are happening in your life, you have spiritual wisdom. Just look at the fruit. And he says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every tree bears, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he says again, thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Let me give you three things, three truths that are here that you need to understand and know. Truth number one, externals are an indicator of an internal reality. Externals tell us the reality about the heart. They don't lie. I'm a golf coach, and one of the things I say to students uh, when I'm teaching them is that um, the golf ball never lies. Student will say to me, um, you know, the ball goes a certain direction, and I'll say to them, here's what happened, and they'll say to me, no, I didn't do that. Well, The golf ball doesn't lie. Where the ball heads when it leaves the club tells you exactly where the face, whether it was open, closed, or square at impact. And what it does after it leaves tells you whether when it hit it, you were either opening the club face or closing the club face. I don't care what you think you did. I don't care what. I went to a golf school, and they had a great phrase. They said to us, they say, feelings are deceiving and results are misleading. In fact, I'm learning this swing. I'm getting frustrated. I'm about, you know, an hour on the range. It doesn't seem to go on, and the instructor must have picked up on that, and he says, come over here. I want to put you on video. So he puts me on video, and he comes back, and he says, I want to show you this, but before I do, how do you feel about it? I said, man, I'm not hitting this at all. I just, I haven't hit one solid shot here. And he says, let me show you something on video. And he shows me on video, and he gets me to my impact position on video, and he says, you are almost dead perfect. But he said, I'm watching you and I'm realizing that you're evaluating what you're doing on the results you're getting at the present time. And if you're not careful, you're going to start making all kinds of adjustments. But he said, the results are misleading. You're very, very close. And he says, now compare this to the first video we did when you came here. And it was dramatic. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Bonnie and I, trying to help our children and, and raising them with that, we had rules like, for instance, you could, if you said something that was hurtful in the family and you apologized, you could never say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. What do you mean you didn't mean that? You may not mean that 99.9% of the time, but according to the scriptures, when you said, I hate you or you're stupid, what did you mean at that moment? 
The externals are an indication of the reality. What we have to do is we have to help people see what those indicate. In other words, we ourselves as growing people and then other people need to help people read these external things and get a a handle on and figure out what those externals are telling me about themselves. They don't lie. I'm saying to myself, why is this making me angry? What is my anger telling me about myself? What is my fear telling me about myself? I just accomplished something. I just, I can remember, I, I went to a great church, and, and through most of my high school years, in fact, when I graduated from high school, I had no intention of, of pursuing ministry, although my church kept saying to me, you need to do this, you need to do this. In fact, I was in a, uh, a preacher boy competition, and I uh, got to the national level, came second in the national level as a high school senior. And as I'm walking through the stage, they hand me this thing, and I walk. And one of the guys that was shaking hands with us as we walked up the stage was from our church. He grabbed my hand. He pulled me in close to him and whispered in my ear, If you don't end up doing something for God in communication, I will hunt you down. You know, like this. And I went on. Why? Because what began to happen was they would have me do things around the church and people would say, you know, that, that was good or you did this well, you did that well. And I'm going and they're saying to me, all these externals are indicating that here's a positive reality. You need to understand this. You need to see this. And then thirdly, so that we can help people. Externals are an indication of a reality we need to figure out for ourselves first and then for others what they are telling us. I remember years ago when my son was in sixth grade, my wife called me at work to tell me that my son's sixth grade teacher called and he was so mad at my son that she said he was like hyperventilating on the phone and she said, uh, I put Joseph on the phone and he's crying and I'm thinking, what in the world? So I say, finally, I get to the point where I'm like, what did he do? And when my wife told me what he did, it just shocked me. She said, he was running in the halls. Now, the guy who's on the phone is like a 32-year veteran in in, uh, teaching sixth grade. Now, to me, if a 32-year veteran is going so crazy he's hyperventilating, you would think the kid was throwing grenades around the school. So I'm thinking to myself, something's not matching here. So I called the school, called this man, and asked if I could have a uh, conference with him, he and my wife. We go out to the school, and they walk me into this room, and I walk into this room, and all the teachers that teach my son are sitting around a table with files that are about that tall, and I'm sitting there, and first I'm looking at those files thinking to myself, I'm in real trouble. My kid has been doing a lot of things around here. I don't know if all these peoples are in files. And and he starts explaining things, and suddenly I realize that there's been a big misunderstanding. And I literally said to the teacher, I said, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I said, there's been a big misunderstanding about why I'm here. So if you don't mind, I'd like to clarify why I'm here. I said, I've got a sixth grade boy. And he didn't do what he was told to do. And I said, I want you, first of all, to understand that if my son does not obey the authorities of this school, I expect him to be disciplined. And apparently there was some kid who uh, was running the halls too, and he didn't get disciplined like Joseph, and they thought I knew that, and they thought that's why I was here. And I said, listen, I don't even know about this other kid, and if you think I'm here because of something unfair, hey, if my kid disobeys and he gets in trouble, that's fair. If you were unfair to anybody, it was the, par- the kid who you didn't do anything with. That's the parents who have an ar- argument, not me. I said, here's why I'm here. I'm trying to raise my kid, and, and here's what I've got. I've either got a boy who has a sixth grade boy, stands out in line, getting ready to go to lunch or music or whatever, and sees this runway, and all these sixth grade genes inside his body just start firing and he's going straight runway, straight one runway, and all of a sudden, boom, he takes off running down there. Or I got a sixth grade boy 
who the teacher says, don't run in the hall, and the seeds of rebellion are beginning to go in his sixth grade boy, and as a sixth grader, he's going, don't run in the halls? Watch me. I said, that's all. I'm trying to figure out so that I know how to respond. I'm going to respond to both because even if it's the sixth grade bugs going off inside of him, I want to teach him how to control his urges. But if I got a kid who the seeds of rebellion are getting to start, I want to get on this early. So I'm just asking for you people to help me figure out where my son is. One of the teachers goes, oh, no, no, no. This, your son is not one of those kids. This is, uh, I'm sorry. And we get in this discussion, and finally the veteran goes, you know what, I'm, as I'm listening to this, he says, I way overreacted to this thing. This is really not that big a deal. And I'm just trying to get a read. I'm just trying to get, because even as a sixth grader, there are going to be externals that reveal something that's going on in my kid's life. And I want to know what's going on so that we can deal with it, so we can understand it. And think about this in light of three types of people. You've probably heard about the person who we talk about knows that they don't know. These are the people that are great to disciple. These are the people who say, listen, I know that my marriage isn't all it needs to be. I know that my walk with God isn't all it needs to be. I just want to learn. I want to learn all the ways. I mean, I couldn't wait to get to this golf school. I, I want somebody to look at my grip. I want somebody to look at my swing. I want somebody who knows what they're doing. I know I don't know everything. I'm not there to prove anything. I'm there because I want that kind of impact. I want that kind of evaluation. There are also people who don't know that they know, and these people, these externals are great because, and this is where the positive, I, I teach a speech class, and one of my favorite things is to get up after a kid gives a speech, and this happens all the time, and says, I'm going to say something to you, and it's going to blow your mind, and here's what I want to say to you. That was amazing. But you gave it like you thought to yourself, I can't do this. I'm required to, so I'll do the best that I can. But you know what? You've got great ability. And you can see sometimes these kids, they had no idea. Sort of like I was telling you about getting on the video. I didn't know. But I was doing this thing right. These are the people, the third one are the category that frustrates us. And these are the people who don't know that they don't know. You ever had those people? They think they get it, but they don't. Well, how do you help these people? Well, is the reality of the fact that they don't know that they don't know going to show up? And yes, because see, here's what's going to happen again. God's going to bring experiences into their lives. Those experiences are going to produce tension. There's going to be a reaction to those experiences. And I'm building relationships with this person so that as these experiences come and they keep coming and they keep coming, eventually I will have an opportunity to keep saying, see, see, there it is again. There it is again. There it is again. To hopefully help these people see, you know what? You don't even know that you don't know. Now, the question I often get is, is it okay to inspect fruit? Is it okay to do this? Is it okay to watch people and try to figure out? Well, let's think about this. Jesus did it. In John chapter 5, verse uh, 41 and following, Jesus says to a group of people, he makes quite an indictment. He says to them, I know that you do not have the love of God in your heart. Now, if I tell somebody they don't have the love of God in their heart, what in essence am I telling them? I'm telling them that they're not saved. Now, what was the external? I don't know if you're familiar with that passage, but the external that Jesus was referring to in John chapter 5, verse 41, was he says, you make every effort to obtain the praise that comes from man, but you make no effort whatsoever to obtain the praise that comes from God. You care about what everybody else thinks about you. But you don't care about what God thinks about you. And if you are a person who never considers God, doesn't care about what God thinks, who is totally and absolutely consumed about what other people think, then you're likely not saved. And in Jesus' case, he said you're not. Jesus said in, John, in Matthew chapter 7, again, he talked about why this is so important. Jesus said, many shall say unto me on that day, what, Lord? And he'll say to you, 
Depart from me, I never knew you. And you know what those people will do? This is what's shocking to me. I, as a youth pastor, used to say to kids, this is not to terrify you because it says immediately when he says that, what do they do? They launch into a set of external behaviors that they say. Here's the externals, and in their minds, that external had an equal sign, and the other side is saved. And he said, those externals may be true, but those weren't the right externals. They didn't indicate salvation. They indicated something else. Well, somebody might say to me, well, hey, uh, Jesus did it, but he has the capacity to look inside. Well, the fact of the matter is that Paul did it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, I would love to address you as worldly, but I can't. You're carnal. And the external reality he saw there was, he says, there's jealousies, there are quarrels among you. And it was over these human loyalties. One guy saying, you know what? I'm more spiritual than you because Paul's my disciple, and I'm more spiritual than you because Apollos is my disciple. And he says, all that indicates this, this friction between you, the arguing, the bickering, the jealous, reveal that you're worldly, you're carnal. I can't even speak to you as spiritual. He says in Galatians chapter 5, Verse 19, he says that here are the fruits and the indicators of the flesh. They're obvious. And he makes this list of all the things that are true of people who aren't saved. And then he also says here's the fruits of the Spirit. But not only did Paul do it, John did it. In John chapter 1, verses 26, he says, you know, if, if, um, if you don't love your brothers... If you don't obey my commands, he goes, the whole book of John is that, right? It's saying to us, here's an external. Well, you can say you're a Christian, but if you hate your brother, the external reality, that's it. Then you're not saved. In fact, that's one of the things we used to say in our youth group with all our parents and kids. We used to say, listen, let's, let's get something off the table so you all understand what we're doing. Every kid who walks into these youth group, we're going to start at the baseline, and we're going to assume that every kid in this youth group is unsaved until they demonstrate to us otherwise. We're not going to go the other direction. What we're going to look for is fruits of life. That's not because we're judgmental. It's not because we're critical. I would do that with my own kids at parent-teacher conferences. I'm asking, tell me what you're seeing. I want to know what that is. I don't want my kid at 18 for somehow to walk away and me go, what in the world was that? I want to pick up on that because we'll get those indicators soon. Nobody goes to bed with an intimate walk with God and walks up the, wakes up the next morning totally rejecting God and buying into the world. It's a process that happens. Just like it's a process of growth. It may be faster going the other way, we see it all throughout the scriptures. Why do we do it? Well, let me give you four reasons. First reason we do it is because of what's true of our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And you know what Jeremiah's conclusion is? Well, who in the world can read their own heart? I don't know about you, but after 52 years of living with me, I've learned that I deceived myself. Now, I wasn't necessarily looking for a truth teller when I got married. In fact, I, I really would have preferred not having one. I really was looking for somebody who, when I did a lousy Sunday school lesson, would really say to me that was the most amazing thing I ever heard. And my very first Sunday school lesson I ever preached as a youth pastor, I realized that God had given me a truth teller. And I said to her, and it was amazing. I mean, it was the greatest lesson those kids had ever heard. I, I think it, it's too bad we didn't video it because it would have, been, uh, would have changed the face of religion in the world. And I'm at, at lunch that day, and I say to my wife, so how did I do today in Sunday school? And she says to me, well, before I answer that question, let me ask you a question. And I say, okay. And she says to me, what exactly were you trying to say? And then an external reality surfaced, and that was that she misunderstood me. She thought I was asking a question. She thought I really wanted feedback, but I wasn't interested in that at all. What I was really saying is, no matter what happened today, I want you right now to tell me I'm wonderful. So I did what every red-blooded American man does at that. I got up from the table and went and pouted someplace. <laughs> you know, wanting to turn around and says, well... I didn't really like the meat, by the way. <laughs> you know, two can play this game. 
But I remember not too long after walking away thinking to myself, she knew I was going to react that way when she told me that. As I told you, she was my high school girlfriend. I mean, in year two of marriage, we've already been a couple for about six years. And I thought to myself, have I ever seen a greater demonstration of love than a woman who's going to tell me the truth, knowing I'm going to get ticked off, but she does it because I need it. I can deceive myself. I can believe things to be true about myself that, in fact, aren't true. We do it, secondly, because we want to help each other. We want to help. I mean, we do this all the time. I do it in athletics. As a coach, I'm trying to get a read on where you're at because I want to help you. I want to help you get better. I want to help you understand something. See, sometimes we see this as, you know, people who put their finger in somebody's face and say, you're ungodly and you don't know God. I know there's that wing of this. I grew up in the very legalistic wing of evangelicalism, but I grew up in the mean one. I grew up in the environment where I'm convinced that in order to work with the youth group, you had to have two characteristics. I mean, at least one, but hopefully two. First thing and most important is you had to hate teenagers. And secondly, you would be most effective if you hated teenagers and were convinced that 100% of them are doing drugs, having sex, and listening to rock and roll. Because everything we ever heard, we didn't hear anything about love. It seemed like everybody was ticked off at us all the time. And we got people sticking their fingers in our faces and telling us how horrible we are. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about loving somebody enough to want to have figure out what's going on so we can help. I want to get a hold of this problem when the kid's in sixth grade, not try to get a hold of it when he's in ninth grade. And, and now we're out of control. I want to be helpful to people. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, Paul says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. What he's most afraid of is that sinful, unbelieving heart causes you to turn away from the living God, left unchecked, will cause you to have a hard heart. And he says, I don't want you to be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So he says to them, therefore, encourage one another daily. Galatians chapter 6 Verses 1 to 5 says, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, what? Restore him. And this was a verse, when we start talking about this as a youth ministry, this is the verse that we printed on all of our materials. James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20 says, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I thank my wife almost every day. Just this week, I Skyped with my daughter Abigail and my grandson James in Fort Myers, Florida, and when we got done, I turned to my wife once again and I said, thank you. Thank you for that girl was seven years old, speaking truth into my life and helping me realize the things I was not aware of was truth so that I can have the relationship I have with my daughter today that would not have been possible otherwise. Third reason is because Satan wants to destroy us. Every one of us have a target on our back. Well, how am I going to know if he's being successful? See, one of the things that amazes me about body life is that all of us know that, but how much of us care enough to really watch out for that? You know, if I find out that somebody's after, you know, if I'm in a church and I find out I'm my brother, somebody's after my brother, do you think I'm not going to be watching his back? Well, how am I going to tell that? The Bible says that he walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I I I'm afraid that you're going to be deceived. People are trying to lead you astray. He communicated to them, I'm afraid that Satan, like he deceived Eve, is going to deceive you. Well, how are we going to be able to tell that? We're going to have to watch real carefully and see, pick up, where's this con? What's happening? Lastly, we want to know how to help somebody. I want to know how to help. 
It was an amazing thing again at this golf camp I went to. We started on like a Tuesday morning. I didn't even hit a golf ball till Wednesday afternoon. They're just trying to figure out where we are. They're trying to figure out what we know. They're trying to figure out all that kind of stuff. We want to help people. And if we want to help people, we want to know how to help, we're going to have to figure out. And so what again is happening is I'm building relationships with these people. I'm spending all kinds of time with them. And again, we all do this, right? But what we do it is to make sure that we don't say the wrong thing. We do it to make sure that we don't sit by them. We do it saying, ah, don't say that, don't bring that up. If you do, this is going to be a reaction, that's going to be the reaction. And we talk about it, but what we typically don't do is take this thing that ha happens naturally and use it to help people. What does the fruit inspection reveal? <coughs> well, first of all, it's probably going to reveal a spiritual condition. It might reveal that this person is not saved. That's what James talks about. If someone claims to have faith but doesn't have fruit, then I don't care what he claims, he's not saved. It might reveal that they're carnal. It might reveal that they're very spiritual. We don't know what it's going to reveal, but I want to know. And I'm going to tell you as a dad, I need to, get, I need to not make this a pride issue. If, if I can know that my kid when he's third and fourth and fifth and in junior high that he's not saved, I want to know that. I don't want to figure that out when he's 24. And I want to get as many people as can help me. I had that conversation with uh, someone on the way out here. Knows my kid in the dorm, and I'm saying, tell me what you're seeing. There's this relationship. Is this good? Is this bad? What's happening? You got eyes in an arena with my son. I don't have eyes. I want to know what's going on. Secondly, what it might reveal is strengths for ministry. It might reveal that this kid really has some great gifts and abilities that he doesn't even know about. He's not even thinking. And how great would that be? That was the amazing thing about the church I went to, them trying to help us. I can still remember my pastor coming to me and saying, listen, I'm going to be on vacation in a couple of months. I was wondering if you could preach for me on Sunday night. I remember thinking to myself, this is so weird. I just thought I heard the pastor ask me to preach on Sunday night. How weird is that? What did you say? You're talking about like the message? You're gone? Like you have people get up? Yeah. You know what that does for a high school kid? It can be as simple as my brother tells a story about the guy that really changed his life was he's working in a kitchen and he's like in junior high and, and things are going crazy. They got ham and the, and the chef comes in real quick and says, hey, go into the, to the uh, walk-in cooler. There's a ham there. I need you to debone it real quick and come out and bring it out to me. And Daryl said, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, and, the, and the guy goes, what are you doing? Go in there and get it. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And he said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? I taught you how to do that. Go in and do it. Daryl said it was the first time in his life he can ever remember somebody believing in his skills and abilities and some guy saying, you got the ability to do this, go do this, and how it changed his whole life. And how do we respond? We just minister at the uh, level it reveals. See, we make this deal in Christianity often about positive or negative is based on where you are spiritually. But do you know that if you examine the scriptures that nobody is ever condemned in the scriptures for being carnal? They're only condemned for being carnal if one thing is true. And you know what that element is? Because by now you should have been teachers. He's not condemning them because they're not teachers. What if we could create this environment of love and acceptance that all we were, we're, we're, not, we're just going to minister to you. We're not going to judge or condemn you. That's the second thing. We're ministering at the level. We're not judging and condemning. We're just trying to get a baseline so we can figure out where to start. Now let's get started. Wouldn't it be awesome if a couple could just walk in and say, we know, we've got to admit, our marriage isn't what it should be. Great, fine. 
We're not judging, condemning. Let's just start right here and make something happen. Just want to be helpful. We just want to grow. And when we talk about this again, it's all predicated on the fact that I'm building relationships with people. They know how much I love them. They know how much I care. And we're together. Remember this companionship thing. So I'm not only trying to help you figure out where you are. You're trying to help me figure out where I am. And we're all growing and working together. Because ultimately what we want to do is we want to give people the resources that will bring about change. But we can't help people change. We can't help people do something about their marriage if we don't know where they're at. And we're not going to be able to help them see what's true if we don't have a relationship with them. What we're doing is biblical. What we're doing is natural. What we're doing is the most loving thing we can possibly do for people. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have on this day to to help people. And I pray for everyone in this room, whether we're like me who've heard the material before or people that's brand new, that we might listen carefully and allow you to pierce our hearts with, first of all, realities that are true about ourselves. Help all of us primarily and first off to walk away from this weekend with realities about ourselves that we're determined to go away from here and work on. And then from that base, be able to be helpful to people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me give you some instructions. There is not a breakout session. There's not a uh, homework assignment for this section, okay? Dennis is going to come up in about uh, 20 minutes, okay? Here's what I want you to do, we want you to do. If you need to stretch or whatever, that's great. But in this next 20 minutes, I would really encourage you to spend some time just praying and asking God to really help you in this day to continue to think about people. That he would help you, for instance, to think about yourself. That as Dennis comes up and begins to help you read, that you'd start primarily with, okay, here's these externals. What am I seeing about myself? What am I learning about the people in my world? That I can be helpful to them and grow.